start recording this thing. Uh, so yesterday, oh, I run through the couple topics that I recorded and then started talking about buckling in general, the, the phenomena of, of instabilities snapping back and forth between states, um, and then specifically talking about column buckling. So in this course, we're buckling is a very broad set of phenomena, that, that instability phenomena, like even a, a pop top lid is a, is a buckling phenomena or an instability phenomena. But here, the only the only mathematical one we'll be looking at is column buckling, which um, is again if you have a long slender rod. There goes my pen. If you have a long slender rod and you compress it, uh, there's some critical load at which it'll go from uniaxial compression to a buckled state. Um, and so, yesterday in class, I had given a couple formulas. So let's talk about column buckling. So this is, if I take a, a slender rod and I compress it, it'll snap kind of spontaneously into a buckled state, um, where this is some p uh, that if so if if my p applied p is less than some p critical, um, then this is this is stable. Um, or uh, no buckling if my p is equal to p critical um, then it's I guess technically neutral but then the second that p is greater than p critical uh, this goes to unstable which then buckles so that means if if I'm applying some load p um, and that P is small, it still stays in that uniaxial compressed state. The second I exceed this critical load, P critical, it'll snap to a new buckled state. Yeah. So what do you mean by uh, So in that energy diagram, basically when, so let's look at this in terms of energy. Um, so when p is less than p critical, I can say that I'm in I'm in some low energy state. Um, as as I start to increase that p p critical, all of a sudden I'm I'm at some neutral energy state. So it could be in a uniaxial compressed state, or it could be in a buckled state, and those are energetically equal. So it it could kind of snap back and forth. When P is greater than P critical, I'm in an unstable energy state, and it wants to then snap to a new stable state. So it's, it's kind of, as, as I continue to increase this P, my, my energy well starts to invert, and it goes from something that's energetically stable to be in a uniaxial compressed state to something that's energetically unstable to be in a uniaxial compressed state and it wants to then pop over. And this, so these energy states, I, I think uh, one, one of the nice examples to visualize them is um, if I have a pinned rod, um, which I had shown with a spring connecting them here at the bottom. This is on rollers. Um, so it's flat. Um, when it's flat, it's in some, or when it when it's in this state, it's it's in some minimum energy state. Mm, da, da, da. Let's say, oh. let's move this over here. So it's something like this. Um, when it's in this this neutral configuration with zero displacement downward, then it's in some energy minimum. Um, when I start pushing it and it's then kind of flat. Uh, it's kind of here at this unstable state 
and then it wants to snap into a new stable state. There's a spring here. So this is state one, two, and three, one, two, and three. So here, this is some minimum energy configuration. This is some maximum energy configuration that it doesn't want to be in. And there it's unstable. And so it snaps over to a new stable configuration. Um, it's, ooh, yes, sorry. So stable, unstable, stable again. And so this is not exactly the energy state that's happening in buckling, but it's kind of conceptually similar, where as long as you are below a certain critical load, you're kind of staying in this energy well. When you push it a little bit harder, it kind of could buckle, it could go back and forth. And so that's, in, in compression, it's that kind of intermediate state where it might buckle a little bit. And then if I apply a heavier load, then it snaps to that new state when I exceed that critical load. Cool. Yes. It just doesn't really seem like there can be anything that's that stable or really not stable. And I'm not understanding what physically is meant by neutral. It means that energetically it's it's equivalent to be in a uniaxial compressed state or in a buckled state. So there's some there's some energy strain when when you're compressing it axially there's some strain energy um, p delta x from from potential energy getting stored in this beam um, when it's bent there's also some potential energy and that's the bending energy in the beam when those two energies are equal to each other that's your critical state so it could be in one energy state or it could be in the other energy state. And so it doesn't necessarily want to be in one or the other. It could be in either and be energetically equal. But if I keep applying a load, it's energetically favorable to be in a bent state. Or if I apply a very small load, it's energetically favorable to be uniaxially compressed. Yeah. So basically, if P is P critical, then it's going to stay in whatever state it's already in. Yes. And so this can also lead to to weird energy pathways where you get hysteresis loops, which I'm not going to get into much, but yeah. So that means if I, if I push it and it buckles, I can, as I unload it all the way, it doesn't magically pop back to that straight state. It stays in that buckled state until I completely remove the load. So your energy kind of goes in a, in a hysteresis loop as you go around. Yeah. Good point or good question. Okay. So, uh, I'm already out of paper now. Um, so I'd given an equation for that, for that buckled state, um, and that or that p critical value. P critical uh, is equal to pi squared e i over k l squared, um, where this i is your area moment of inertia, e is Young's modulus, l is the beam length, uh, and k is now an effective length factor that is kind of there to, to, depending on what our boundary condition is. So I'll go through that analysis a little bit today. Um, we will hopefully be able to get through it, but I'll kind of show you where this k comes from. But um, a couple things I wanted to point out first is the, the sensitivity to buckling of different parameters. So um, when you're working with different materials, if you have a material that is twice as stiff, so if, if E doubles, um, E goes to 2E, then uh, your P critical goes to 2P critical. So if, if a material is twice as stiff, it's twice as difficult to buckle. Your I, your, or let's look at L. Um, so my length, if my length is twice as long, uh, my P critical is then a quarter easier to buckle. Um, so if I have kind of a really short stubby beam, it's generally pretty difficult to buckle. And as I increase that beam length, it gets exponentially or quadratically easier to buckle. 
So this is also part of what you'll be looking at in the Beam Lab. Um, the most significant one uh, is your area moment of inertia. So I, uh, for, let's do a circular rod because that's a little bit easier to visualize and then I don't have to worry about anisotropy. Um, for a circular rod is pi over four r to the fourth. Uh, for circular, for circular rod. Um, real quick, had you guys gone through area moments of inertia much in other classes? Okay, so I don't need to dig into that too much and definitions of that. All right. Um, so when I here is r over 4, when r gets doubled, when r goes to 2r, my p critical is then 16 times harder because this is an r to the fourth contribution. So you can think about it in terms, actually, this is kind of a an easier way to, to think about it. Um, so if I have a skinny rod cross-section, um, oh, how do I want to do this? Um, so if I have a rod like this, and I'm looking at the cross-section, and the cross-section is something long like this, so this is an H, this is a B, um, then it's going to be much, much easier to buckle in this direct in one direction than the other. So my here, my I sub Y versus my I sub X. Um, my I sub X is going to be much, much higher than my I sub Y. So when you look at like a ruler, for example, this is kind of that long skinny configuration it's really easy for me to buckle in the skinny direction because my eye is much, much lower um, than in this direction. It's, I mean, it's pretty much never going to buckle out of plane here just because that aspect ratio is so huge. So if you have an anisotropic beam, if you have like an eye beam, for example, um, which has different area moments of inertia about those two axes, it'll preferentially buckle in one direction or the other. So that's kind of the other thing you need to think about when you look at your eye. So this eye gives a, a huge sense of your geometry, um, and it can also be anisotropic, depending on what beam you're using. We're using circular rods in the, in the beam buckling lab to make it easy, so you don't have to worry about it, but something to keep in mind. Yeah. Yeah, basically. It could be based on the boundary condition. So if, if it's more compliance in one direction or the other, or if it's slightly ovalized in one direction or the other, um, then it'll go in that way. And so in the lab, you'll see, um, or people yesterday would have, who had their lab yesterday would have seen this already, but it could buckle in plane, it can buckle out of plane, it could buckle kind of anywhere in that direction because it's a circle, so it's kind of random. Yeah, it's, it's it's based on the imperfections, or the, yeah. Um, okay, so going through this derivation for how we actually get to this p critical, well, this p critical. Uh, I'm going to start first with a simpler example. So I'm going to instead of looking at the actual rod configuration, I'm going to start with something a little bit easier, um, which is a rigid beam in compression with a spring on the side of it. So uh, let's look at rigid model example. So in this problem setup, I'm going to have uh, a spring coming from the side of a board, a long skinny rod. Uh, this spring is going to be on sliders. This rod is going to have a pin condition down here at the bottom. Uh, and I'm going to be applying a load P to this. This spring is going to have some stiffness K. It's going to be some length L. I can define coordinate systems here, X and, or, oh, let's define X in the beam direction. X and, uh, 
x and y. Um, so x is along the axis of the beam, and y is out. So when I apply this load to the beam, basically this is this is the uh, how do I want to do this? I'll do it with this guy. This is what keeps rolling off the table. Um, here, basically, this is the the loading situation that I'm defining. So, oh, that's going to be too big. Let's do it with a shorter one. And let's do it with a single spring. Okay. So here I have some rod. Let's do it this way. Some column uh, that I'm applying a uniaxial force to. Um, there's a stable configuration where I'm just pushing this down, and then there'll be another stable configuration, which isn't actually going to be stable because it's not actually pinned, uh, where it kind of pops over here to the side and the spring extends. So, oh boy, these pens just do not want to cooperate with me today. Um, but that's kind of the idea. There's some stretchy spring, a, a, a infinite. we're gonna say an infinitely stiff rod, so we're gonna ignore the compliance of the rod itself, um, and we're just gonna, take the, the load P here. So I'm going to say there's some stable state where it's still vertically compressed, and then there's some other stable state um, where this then deflects out this spring, then extends. Uh, the length of the rod here is still L. This now uh, X, or Delta Y, Delta Y, uh, this is now some Delta X, uh, where uh, if this is then deflected by some angle theta, uh, Delta Y is sine, L sine of theta, sine of theta, Delta x is L cosine of theta. My P is still going to be acting vertically. And now inside here, there's going to be some force from the spring. So what I'm going to do to try to find a balance in this guy uh, is about this point, about this point zero. I'm going to take the sum of the moments around zero. So here now I have some load P acting in the vertical direction at a distance Y away. So I have some P delta Y. Um, in the opposite direction, I have some force due to the spring. The force from the spring is uh, K delta, well, yeah, I guess K delta Y. Um, not only k delta x, but just delta y here in the configuration that I have, so the amount that it's stretched. Um, so acting in the opposite direction uh, for our moment diagram, this is then minus uh, k delta y, and then it's acting at a distance delta x away. Delta x. So this we can rewrite as p l sine theta minus k l sine theta l cosine theta. If we then, so what I want to now find is I can, I can just kind of intuitively say there's, there's some state where it's going to be purely compressed and some state where it's going to snapper. And what I want to find is that transition point where that's going to happen that critical load P. So I'm going to assume, for the sake of simplicity, a small angle, because right at that initiation point, there's going to be a small angle deflection. Um, so small angle means the sine of theta is one, sine is theta. This then, if we continue on to another page, um, now I can say the PL, so this is now PL theta minus uh, K 
L squared theta. And that transition is going to happen when this is equal to zero, when those basically the spring energy and the compressed energy are, are equal to each other. Um, and so that happens when my P, I can factor some stuff out, um, L theta is uh, P minus K L is equal to zero. So there's here now, uh, there's a stable state when theta is equal to zero. So theta equal to zero being this vertical compressed state. And there's another stable state when P is equal to K L. So this is now my, my P critical is when that transition between when these two states are going to happen is when that P critical is equal to K L. So basically the energy that I'm getting um, from, or not quite the energy, but the moment that I'm getting from uh, from the axial compression and the moment that I'm getting from the spring with each other out, this is going to be that critical transition point. So when P critical is less than KL, again, this is stable, uh, or sorry, when P is less than KL. When P is equal to KL, this is again neutral, so it could be in either one of those configurations, and then when P is greater than KL, this is unstable. So it's going to kind of define when that when that snapping action happens, and basically, if I if I take that pen, and I oh this isn't going to work again. If I take that pen and I keep compressing it, there's some point where it kind of wants to snap over because stretching that spring is easier. It is lower energy than staying vertically compressed. We can kind of visualize that a couple ways. So um, we can look at it in terms of our P and theta space. So theta, P. So I can say basically there's some, um, the amount of load that I have to apply to get a certain deflection there's some stable state where I, I just kind of travel vertically along this axis. This is supposed to be straight here. Um, and then there's some new state where initially, uh, where this KL comes over, where I can start changing the angle uh, with a very low uh, increase in the applied load. Eventually, as I, as I keep applying P and that, that beam rotates more and the spring stretches out more, this is going to start kind of going up. But basically here now, this, this transition point, this is our bifurcation point, where it can energetically, or where it, where it can stay in one state, and I can keep increasing the P vertically, or it can snap over <coughs> to another state. You can also look at this in terms of an energy diagram. Um, so, or, uh, no, that's the right one. But you, you can think about it energetically. So the basically, as I'm pushing harder and harder, I'm, I'm linearly increasing the energy of that of, that's stored inside the beam. Uh, if there's a small rotation, then I'm increasing the energy that's stored in the spring. And at some point, the energy that's, uh, it wants to minimize the energy in the system, so it'll stretch out the spring preferentially instead of keeping that axial compression in the beam. Cool. Cool. So let's actually take this same idea, the same sort of analysis, and apply it to a buckling beam. So I'm going to look initially at, at a pin pin beam, because that's kind of the simplest initial case to be thinking about. Um, so I'm going to look at a pinned pinned beam example. Now, here I have my beam starts off. Uh, I'm going to draw it like this now. It starts off in some state like this. Uh, da, 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 da. This makes more sense than the other configuration. If I really wanted to be thorough, I could draw another roller on the other side. 
um, so that this thing can't move left or right. It has to stay vertically. Um, I think yesterday I just drawn one of these on the other side and said there was a force, which isn't diagrammatically correct. Um, but anyway, so uh, this beam has some length L, uh, and I'm going to be applying some load P to the top. At some point, we're going to assume that this beam is going to buckle over to a new state. So at some point, this beam is going to then buckle over and deflect. Um, here now, at this cut end of the beam, so here at the bottom, there'll still be some reaction force P, but here in this cut section now, I basically have a beam in bending. So I have a beam that, or a beam in bending that's also being axially compressed. So I have now there's some moment here inside, there's some force um, inside F. These are going to vary as a function of x, where x. <coughs> oh, oh, sorry. Um, where x is along the length of the beam and y is out of the plane, this is going to be deflected by some distance v of x. Um, and so now. What I can do is, is again take a sum of moments at this endpoint of the beam. So, or a sum of forces and a sum of moments to try to figure out um, where this instability might happen. So, I can take a sum of forces in the x. I know that that's in, as the way that I've drawn it here, that's f of x, uh, or that's my force F uh, plus P. And I know those forces have to balance out to be zero, uh, which then means my F of X is just equal to minus P. So it's actually a constant. It's not changing along the length here. Um, and then my sum of moments, I'm gonna take about the zero point, that point here at the, at the bottom. Um, I know that my P doesn't affect it because it's going through the center. My moment now here, um, I have some F of X acting at a distance V. So, or I don't want to do this. So we'll define clockwise to be positive. So I have uh, some M of X acting in a positive direction. F of X is now acting uh, anti-clockwise. So this is some F times the deflection V of x, um, and I know that this sum of moments also has to be zero. Now for, oh, um, now I know my f is negative p. My moment actually, we can go, because it's a beam in bending, we can relate this to our deflection, um, where m is ei uh, d squared v dx squared. If you remember that equation from when we had derived some of our beam bending theory. Um, so I can take this moment equation, plug it in. Uh, uh, it has some names on it. What that sheet's doing. Um, so I can take this moment, plug it in, and say now uh, I have the EI. Uh, w or B, B double prime. My F is my F is negative P. That's probably an easier way to do it. My F is negative P, so this then becomes plus P V is equal to zero. So now we're we end up at an ordinary differential equation. Um, this. I don't know how many of you were too familiar with it. I can rewrite it. B P over E I B is equal to zero. I can define some constant D uh, is equal to square root of P over E I. 
and the general solution to this ODE is sines and cosines, um, which is possibly familiar depending on how recently you took differential equations. Uh, so our general solution, our V of X, is then some C1 sine of uh, dx, where uh, I guess this is v double prime plus d squared v is equal to zero, the general solution to that, I'm plugging in my d here, uh, plus c2 cosine of dx, that looks like a p, erase the bottom there. So this is now our, our general solution to this ODE. So the question now is when I'll get an instability. So what I can do is to try to figure out what these constants are, what our C1 and our C2 are. I can say uh, I know for that beam, uh, for, for this beam here, I know the deflection here at zero, the deflection at zero is zero, the deflection at L is zero. So I can use those two boundary conditions. I can say V at zero is equal to V at L. Both of these are equal to zero. So I know if I plug in zero, I get C2 um, cosine of zero is zero. So my C2 goes away and my C1, uh, sorry, when I plug in L, say V zero, is equal to C2 is equal to zero. V at L, uh, I'm gonna then say this is C1 uh, sine of DL is equal to zero. Now, there's a couple ways we could solve this, or there's a couple solutions here. One, our C1 is just zero. So that means in this particular loading situation, our V would be zero, which means there would be no deflection. So that's kind of the easy solution where the whole thing in compression just stays uniaxially compressed. There's some other state where our sine actually is equal to zero, and that's the interesting state. So it doesn't, we don't actually care too much what the C1 is, um, but what's interesting is when the sine of DL is equal to zero. So we know sine of DL is going to be zero at intervals of zero pi, two pi, three pi, and so on. So, or when DL is equal to zero pi, two pi, three pi. So I can say DL, or now square root, I'm going to plug this back in, of P over EI. Um, L is equal to zero or pi or two pi, um, or just some integer n pi, some integer n times pi. Um, so our, uh, basically the, the, when this, now the, the order of this, when I, if I have different values of p plugged into here, uh, this is going to affect how sinusoidal this function is. If, and if it's a single order of pi, I'm gonna have one half loop. If I, if I have a two pi, it's gonna be a two pi loop. Um, and so my interesting solution now basically happens when I'm gonna solve E as a material constant, I as a ge geometry, L as geometry. I'm gonna solve for my P here. Uh, I'm gonna say this is now N squared, pi squared. I'm gonna bring the E I over to the top over L. And so this is basically when I'm when I'm applying a certain load P, uh, this can then snap effectively into different loading configurations. Uh, dun, dun, dun. That's not uh, was that right? That might have been right. One, two, yeah, sure, that's fine. Uh, 
3, and so on. So this is when my n is equal to 1, this is when my n is equal to 2, n is equal to 3, uh, and so on. So my, my deflected shapes now, depending on when I apply different critical loads p, I can be getting these different shapes. It turns out, yeah. Uh, sort of, yeah, basically. So, so if I plug now p critical back into here, yeah, I would be getting, depending on what that n is, I'm getting different wave values. Um, so, it turns out the lowest energy state, the easiest state to be buckled into, is when n equals one. So if n equals 1, then we say our p critical is pi squared ei over l. Oops, this is squared. Um, yeah, and so this you may recognize back from the equation that I've shown you before for what our, our beam buckling general solution is. And so uh, I think yesterday I had shown what some of these values for k are. For this pin pinned example, this is the base example that people sort of look at. And so this is when uh, k is equal to 1. And so we end up with pi squared over ei. And so that's now if I, my lowest energy state again is going to be that single half sine wave function. It's going to be going between, uh, going half sine wave through the length here. Um, it's actually sort of possible to get other stable Buckles, buckled states, it's difficult because then it still wants to snap back to that single state because this is so energetically unfavorable because there's now the more curves I have, the more bending energy there is in this thing. Um, there are actually a few instances where you will see that sort of sinusoidal buckling where these higher order buckling modes come in. Um, and that particularly happens in composites or confined fiber materials. So if I have, um, if I have say a rod made of a soft polymer, so like a like a silicone or something, and I have a hard fiber inside of it, uh, let's draw this. Um, when I compress it in a compressed state, this will actually internally this fiber will then go through this sinusoidal buckling shape a lot of the time. And basically that's because when when it deforms inside a medium, when it's confined by other stuff, and I and I displace it, that displacement also causes there to be strain energy built up in the surrounding material. And so to minimize the strain energy in the system, it's actually easier to have smaller displacements in the rod. So it minimizes the, the energy in the rod and the energy in the surrounding medium. So for carbon fiber composites, this actually it's not really, it doesn't normally happen with carbon fiber composites. It can happen with I think like glass fiber composites sometimes, um, but it's really common with softer matrix. Normally, epoxy is a little bit too stiff, um, and carbon fibers are too brittle. But so this this type of higher order sinusoidal buckling mode can happen. It's just not not normal for single column buckling. This is generally the shape that you'll get, um, and it's that p critical is happening when you have this pi squared e i over l. Um, how much time do we have? Yeah. So theoretically, then, if a column could um, support a greater loading, if you continued to add force um, on the ends, would it move from an n equals one state to like an n equals two? It could potentially. Um, so if you if you loaded it really fast before it was able to buckle, it could snap into that order or third or third order state, a buckled state. Um, it doesn't happen most of the time. It, it, it'll happen when there's confinement. So like here, 
I'm using my fingers for confinement, basically, and I'm getting a higher ordered buckled state. Um, so assuming yeah. it didn't have enough space to do a single buckle one way or the other, it would... Yeah. So uh, actually, yeah. So that's, that's another situation where it can happen when you're threading a rod through a pipe. So I think trying to, trying to pull a, push a drain cleaner through a pipe, when you push it, the very end will start to buckle, um, but then that'll hit the wall on the inside, and then it'll kind of buckle through the length. So confinement can lead to these higher order buckled states, um, similar to being confined inside a, an elastic solid. Um, yeah. OK. So I'm going to save. There's, there's a full, a more complicated derivation for this that I think I'll go through on Friday. Um, but today, because it's actually relevant for the, I'm going to jump back to a uh, different related topic. Where am I? There I am. OK. So this was, this was just our derivation for the pin-pin beam. Tomorrow I'll show how you get some of the different, some of basically how you get that k factor in there for other shapes. But an important question to be asking from a design side is when buckling will happen. So we know that, let's, let's call this the transition to buckling. Transition to buckling. I can spell things. Buckling. There we go. Um, so I know that if I have a short, stubby block, if I have something really small, short, stubby rod, uh, and I compress this, this is then going to yield, it's depending on whether it's brittle or ductile, it'll yield normally along a maximum resolved shear plane, um, and I'll get a failure kind of shear failure, shear yielding going through my rod. I know that if I have something very long and skinny, a very long slender rod, and I apply a load to this, this will then buckle. Um, like when I have a very long skinny rod. But then the question is when does that transition happen? When will it buckle and when will it yield? So to figure that out, um, basically we have, so we have our P critical when buckling will happen is again pi squared EI over KL squared. Um, to find out when that transition between yielding and buckling happens, I can actually just set this. So I know my stress in my body is P over A. I can set my um, critical stress, my sigma CR, which is equal to PCR over A um, equals pi squared EI over KL squared. When that's equal to my yield strength, I know that that's going to be the transition point between when I'll have a column that yields and when I have a column that buckles. It's not always exactly that clean. Um, and basically, as, as columns get more and more slender, so, so when I, if I have a short stubby beam and I, and I push on it and it buckles, it could still be yielding on the outer surface of that beam after yielding because then there's a high bending stress there. Um, when I push on the beam, when I push on a long slender one and it buckles, it's going to pop back because the stress on the outside edge of the beam isn't high enough to cause it to yield. But um, for there, there's also some transition when if I have something very, very short and I push on it, it's not going to buckle at all and it's going to be pure yielding. So there's some state where I have pure yielding, there's some state where it buckles and it still yields, and then there's another state where it's slender enough that I can, I can buckle it and it will still pop back. Um, but what I'm interested in is that transition point between when it yields to when it starts buckling. And to do that I can set my crit stress, which is P critical over A, over A, equal to my sigma yield. There we go. That was the thing that was missing. So 
I'm going to define a couple constants to simplify things. Um, so I'm going to call a slenderness ratio, uh, which I have somewhere. Uh, reduce gyration. Where is my slenderness ratio? L over R. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to define a slenderness ratio. S here uh, is equal to L over R G, where my R G is. So this is slenderness. Slenderness ratio. Spelling is not forte today. Um, and I'm going to define now this is going to be a radius of gyration. So I'm going to define this to be the square root of i over a. This is a radius of gyration. Um, so we're going to put these in for simplicity for to kind of uh, show you what these would be for a circular beam. This would be uh, pi over 4 uh, r to the fourth over pi r squared square root, which is just ends up being r over 2, r over r, r over 2. Um, so it, it this is a, a general formula for if I have any beam cross section. Um, if it's not circular, it, it's kind of like an effective radius, sort of, but um, we're going to use it to, to simplify a couple things here. So if I take, okay, um, if I take that slenderness and radius of gyration now and start plugging them in, I can say my sigma critical, uh, sigma CR, is equal to pi squared e i over a k l squared, uh, which is then equal to, I'm going to plug in radius of gyration. So this is pi squared e, uh, this is r g squared. I'm going to pull out k squared l squared. Um, and then now I have my slenderness ratio, L over RG. Uh, this is pi squared E over K squared S squared. Um, so this is now sort of a simplified formula for that critical mass. And the transition now between yielding and buckling is going to happen again when this is equal to sigma yield. So what I want now is to figure out what slenderness ratio I have to have, what my S is going to be geometrically be before this thing starts to go. So now S S is the only one parameter in here that has any, geom any geometric factors in there. K is boundary conditions, E is uh, material, sigma yield is material, pi is pi. Um, so now I can say my S um, transition, sure, transition, uh, I'm going to move some stuff around, this is, uh, pi, pi over k, square root of now e over sigma yield, um, yes, okay, so, basically what this means now, is in my state in my uh, here where I have s is equal to l over rg um, and where I have now uh, p over a stress is equal to p over a if I have a very low slenderness ratio I'm just going to be yielding so there's some yield stress here where where my where if I apply uh, some load, my, my bar will, will be plastically deforming. At some point now, that'll transition um, where this is S transition, um, or 
pi over k e sigma uh, e over sigma y, and <coughs> my the maximum stress that I'll be applying in the beam is going to kind of decrease exponentially. We're here now. This is pure yielding, uh, and this is pure buckling. Uh, when I'm kind of somewhere in in that early transition ratio, it's going to buckle and then plastically deform in addition. And then as I make it more and more slender, it's just going to be pure buckling. But, yeah. Okay.